We never want to be doing unnecessary procedures, procedures that either aren't going to benefit their health in the short or the long term, or where the risks outweigh that benefit. So if we have a very tiny benefit, but the risk is kind of fairly significant, that's definitely something where we want to be questioning whether it is the right decision. Welcome to the Call the Vet Show, the podcast that helps pet parents understand and optimize the health of their furry family so they can live the full and happy life you want for them. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Hello, Kiora, and welcome back to another episode of the show. It's great to be spending some time with you again for another episode. And in this episode, I'm talking about a, a really common concern that a lot of my clients have, especially if they have older animals, older dogs and older cats. And this is the topic of anesthetic and surgical risk and how we could actually make this safer. But before we get into that, I'd just love to remind you that if you're not already hit that follow button on whatever app you're listening to this on, if it's on YouTube, because we're now on YouTube, hit that subscribe and make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes. You can also share this with any pet owning friends or family that you have to really help me spread the word to reach more pet parents and to help impact the lives of more pet dogs and cats, no matter where they are in the world. I'd love it if you could help me in that mission. But for now, let's jump into this week's episode where I'm actually bringing you a bit of an audio mashup of a couple of different videos that I've produced. So I had planned to uh, re-record these episodes effectively in one podcast episode to make it an audio first experience. But um, to be honest, I've been really busy in the clinic in my day job. And so I figure something's better than nothing. And I know you're going to get heaps of value out of this episode. So if your dog is ever facing surgery, if your cat is old and you're wondering whether you should get a procedure that involves anaesthetic or sedation carried out, then this episode is definitely for you. And now on with the show. Don't gamble with your dog's life. If they're undergoing surgery, you need to know if they're at a high or a low risk of dying under anesthesia. It's the worst case scenario for everyone involved and this is what you need to know. So we have some really good figures involving high numbers of dogs. One UK study which looked at 150,000 dogs showed that there were 14 deaths per 10,000 procedures. 10 of those per 10,000 were within 48 hours of that procedure. So are definitely likely to be due to that sedation, that anesthetic, or that surgical procedure. Now, clearly this is going to depend on the health of your dog to begin with and also the type of surgery that they're going to have. So for neutering surgeries in dogs, our desexing, our spay neuter, then the risk is much smaller than this 10 in 10,000. It's actually down at one death per 10,000 neutering procedures. And this is 0.01%. Now those that did die, there were two following castration and six following ovariohysterectomy. So that then is related to the, the degree of difficulty of that surgery. Although we think of a spay and ovariohysterectomy as a fairly routine procedure, and I'm certainly doing them every week, sometimes every day of the week, they are a routine in inverted commas procedure. They are quite involved, and certainly for our less experienced vets, that is a bit of a, a hurdle to jump through to get comfortable in that procedure. But compared to a castration, much simpler procedure, and this clearly reflects on the fact that the risk is much lower. Now, of those dogs that did die following a, a neuter, a desexing procedure, 60% of those had an ASA score of one or two, and 40% had scores of three. And I'll come on to what that means in just a little bit. It's also worth noting that there's actually no association seen in this study between the age of the puppies at the time of neuter and their risk of death. Now, we should be desexing them, spaying, neutering them at a very young age is a topic for another day. Certainly the, the old fashioned uh, six months is the routine recommendation is, is not applicable anymore. And in my mind, we shouldn't be doing them younger than six months for any reason, apart from maybe if they're in a shelter situation and they want to be absolutely certain they're not going to be contributing to overpopulation. A story for a different day like I say. But the other thing to note is that the stud a study of another 
big group of dogs that happened the previous decade had a reported death of much higher, of point. Uh, 0.17% risk of death. So that compares to a 0.01%. So it's fair to say that probably we're a little bit further on again from that 150,000 dog study. So the, the, the risk of death is likely even less. Again, as monitoring equipment improves, as our drugs improve, as our training and overall staff involvement also improves. But it's all very well and good thinking what that risk is for our, our routine procedures but what about if your dog is going through something more involved something less common what happens if they aren't as healthy as a, a young animal who's had no medical complaints well we're lucky here again because we have figures from multiple different countries as well so spain argentina france the uk the usa chile portugal and australia kind of pooled and they looked at the health of the individual dog and their risk of dying. So this is where the ASA score comes in. So this is our way of classifying kind of the, the overall health of our surgical patients and then the risks of anesthesia to them. So our ASA 1 individuals are completely healthy patients. There's nothing wrong with them. They are perfectly normal in tip-top health and they have a risk of dying of 0.08 percent. So that's one in 1,250 surgical procedures. Moving on to our ASA2 dogs. So these are suffering from mild systemic, so whole body disease that is generally very well controlled. So we're even thinking about controlled diabetes here, but it could be that they are very young, they're very old, or they are obese. And this is actually a pretty important one because obesity is such a common problem in our pet dog population that actually 60% of dogs are going to be classified as ASA2 just because of their weight. And here, the risk of dying did increase. It went up to 0.24%. So that's one in 416 surgical patients. As health deteriorates, we move up the scale to ASA3. So these are dogs with um, obvious whole body systemic diseases. So that could be anemia. It could be a low grade heart disease. It could be a degree of dehydration. There could be some liver disease present. And that increases the surgical risk of death to one percent so one in every hundred dogs and then as things get even worse we move to ASA4 where we've got severe systemic disease that is a constant threat to life so that clearly says that these dogs are not healthy they're actually in a pretty bad way and you can understand here that their risk of dying is going to be a lot more we're thinking about advanced heart disease uh, uncontrolled diabetes emaciation um, end-stage liver or kidney disease and here Unsurprisingly, the risk is 6.5%, so one in 15 dogs. These guys are not going to be having surgery unless it's for a life-threatening condition where the risks of not carrying out that surgery significantly outweigh the risk of having that anesthetic and surgical procedure performed. And I guess this is a good time to, to actually think about that risks benefit because no matter what your dog's health, we never want to be doing unnecessary procedures, procedures that either aren't going to benefit their health in the short or the long term or where the risks outweigh that benefit. So if we have a very tiny benefit, but the risk risk is kind of fairly significant, that's definitely something where we want to be questioning whether it is the right decision. There's lots of times where this comes up. It's typically with our older animals and maybe getting that dental procedure. Now, if they're otherwise healthy, they're probably only going to be in an ASA you know, two, maybe there'll be one. If we delay that procedure though, when we wait for them to stop eating, for example, then they're going to be a higher ASA score. The risks are going to be higher. And so it's much better to actually get that done sooner. Equally, if you've got a dog with a growth that is not expected to be life-threatening, then actually having an anesthetic and surgery to remove that tumor may not be in their best interest because the risk of death or significant complications through surgery is actually higher than the benefit that they're going to get. And then the last dog health category, if you like, ASA5. Now these are dogs that are not expected to survive without the operation. So here we're thinking severe trauma, sepsis, so that might be a perforated intestine. Maybe they've eaten something spiky, it's punched a hole in their intestines and they've developed a really nasty sepsis. End stage liver kidney disease that is really impacting their life. Their risk of death is going to be 16%, so that's one in six. Equally without the surgery that is being performed, they're not expected to survive anyway. So here, you know, we really need to be 
thinking, is it in our pet's best interests? Ultimately, the alternative is likely to be euthanizing them, which isn't always the wrong thing. We need to be thinking about what's best as an overall quality of life benefit for our patient rather than maybe focusing on the next kind of day or week. And then there are some other really important factors to consider when it comes to the risk of anesthetic death in our dogs. There's a higher risk if the anesthesia and surgery is performed after hours. Um, so middle of the night, unsurprising. Um, I work all day, I'm on call all night, and then I work the next day. If I'm called in at two in the morning and have to perform an emergency surgery, that risk is going to be higher than if I'm performing that same surgery in the middle of the day with my full team around me. Equally, an urgent procedures are associated with a higher mortality rather than ones that are scheduled in advance. There's a 13.6 times odds of dying, irrespective of the actual specific surgery, if it's performed as an urgent rather than a, a scheduled surgery. And also paediatrics, so our really um, kind of young puppies and our geriatric, our senior dogs, also have an increased risk due to surgery, due to anesthesia. And then obesity, again, is a risk factor for mortality, irrespective of otherwise body health. Okay, so that video clip was all about the risks of anaesthetic, obviously, and hopefully that gives you some clarity around what your dog's individual risk may be if they have uh, an upcoming procedure, a surgery, an anaesthetic, and in their in their on their horizon. Um, and hopefully that gives you some confidence that actually the risks aren't nearly as bad as you might have thought they were or if your dog is very unwell and those risks are higher then ultimately the risks of doing nothing are potentially much worse and this is where that risk benefit analysis needs to come in but despite these risks there are steps that you can take to make sure they are kept as low as possible and this is where the next audio clip comes in there is always a small risk regardless of why your dog needs surgery or anesthesia, but why wouldn't you take action to reduce their risk of complications and even death? Well, these five steps will help you to keep your dog as safe as possible if they need surgery, sedation, or anesthesia. The first step is to actually optimize their health prior to having the procedures performed. And this can take some time, so it depends on why they're having that procedure, why they're being anaesthetized, as to how possible this is going to be. But with 60% of our dogs classed as overweight or obese, and knowing that this increases their risks of complications, weight loss is definitely going to be the first step if possible. We can also better control any other additional diseases or any other problems that we know to be present. If they're diabetic, make sure that that is really nicely controlled. If they've got underlying skin disease, then make sure that there's no secondary infection. Really focus on just making sure they are as healthy as possible before they have that procedure. But then the other consideration is actually having a surgical procedure carried out before they get too old or before their health deteriorates. And I see this a lot where people are really worried about the risk of surgery. So delay a procedure only for it to be needed six months, 12 months, two years later when their pet is older and when their health is less optimal. Actually, it would have been better to jump in sooner rather than leave it to this stage. The next way to reduce risk is to actually have some pre-surgery medications. This is especially important for our brachycephalic dogs, um, our squash-nosed dogs, where they are at a higher risk of what we call aspiration, so where they maybe regurgitate and then they breathe that into their lungs, which can be catastrophic. So we want to maybe be giving them anti-vomiting medication, gastroprotectant, so things that will stop an esophagitis, stop any reflux. For diabetics, we want to make sure that we are giving them the appropriate dose of insulin. Obviously, your veterinary team will talk to you about that. If your dog is on any other long-term medications, then should you withhold that on the morning of the surgery? Should you actually give that? It's really important to be clear and talking to your veterinary team is crucial for this. And this comes on to the next safety step which actually is on the day of surgery, that we can take some really big actions to make sure we're keeping our patients, our pets, our dogs as safe as possible. And these are again things to discuss with your veterinary team. So we want to discuss fluid therapy. It's definitely a good idea to have an IV catheter placed and have IV fluids running. It helps support blood pressure. It helps provide an open line, what we would call open access to the blood should we need to give an intravenous injection. There's nothing worse than a dog struggling under anesthesia or sedation and not actually having a catheter in place and then 
your vets, your team are scrambling around trying to get a catheter placed while your dog is potentially crashing and dying before their eyes. Fluids is a really good idea. Can we do some blood tests beforehand? So a pre-anesthetic blood test just to check that there's no hidden problems going on. You know, every surgical patient should have a full physical examination happen before they are anaesthetized. And this is a really good check of general body health, but actually to check organ health, we need that blood test. And it can be really crucial, especially for our older patients, where there's definitely more value in it of having that done a few days before they have their procedure or on the morning of the procedure. We are really lucky in that as veterinary clinics, most clinics will have blood testing equipment in their building so they can get results very, very quickly within about 20, 30 minutes of taking that blood test. It doesn't need to be sent off to an external laboratory, which can take several days. And then we need to be thinking about fasting our dog. So this again helps with reducing any regurgitation and any risk of aspiration. There are going to be some exceptions to this. So if we have got a diabetic dog, it may be that we don't want them fasted or we want them fed a little bit later than they would otherwise have been fed. If we've got any young dogs, if there's any other concerns, it may well be that there is a different instruction that is given by your vets. So the next check that you can carry out is actually checking the staff involved. So what qualifications do the nurses and tech technicians have. And in different parts of the world, there's different regulations about who's able to be called a veterinary nurse or a veterinary technician. And it doesn't actually necessarily mean that they are qualified to any degree, but also to what degree are they qualified? What skill levels do they have? How many members of staff are going to be involved with monitoring the anaesthetic, with looking after your dog in the post-operative period, which is actually where one of the biggest risks is. So definitely check that out. And then at the same time, you can ask about facilities. So what facilities does your vet clinic have? You know, do they have these blood machines that we can can run that pre-anesthetic sample the morning um, of that surgery? Do they have advanced monitoring equipment? Things like a pulse oximeter, which checks how oxygenated the blood is. Capnography, which checks how well a dog is breathing. An ECG, which shows any arrhythmias, any possible problems with their heart. All this equipment does add extra cost likely to the bill, but actually it helps improve the safety of the anesthesia to a really huge degree. And this is actually where it's important to almost disregard cost as a decision maker, or certainly disregard the lowest cost and going for that option. Because if a clinic is providing the same surgery in inverted commas at a much cheaper price, we've got to ask ourselves, what corners are being cut? Um, are there qualified staff? Is there any monitoring equipment? Is different surgical kit being used for every individual? We really don't want to be going by price alone when it comes to deciding where it is best for your pet to have their surgery, regardless of what surgery they're having. Helping your pet live the happy, healthy life they deserve. <coughs> I'll leave links to the studies and some more information about uh, what we've discussed today over in the full show notes at callthevet.org. Um, I'd also love to hear what you think. So you can hit me up on all of the usual social channels. It's YouTube that I'm most active on in the comments section um, when I do get a chance to, to dive into those and spend some time replying. But I do read every every comment and I love hearing from you. So with that, out of the way. It's been great to spend some time with you again for another episode. And until the next one, I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is the Call the Vet Show because they're family. That's it for this episode of the Call the Vet Show. Be sure to visit callthevet.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. We'll see you next time.